welcome back to the lecture series in animal physiology. So, we are into week uh, sixth and we have finished uh, two lectures and I have introduced you to the anatomy of the brain specifically with the anatomy of the hippocampal region which is where we will be concentrating for next uh, two, three classes where we will be talking about epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease and uh, memory. So, if you remember in the last class I told you that you know there are uh, two major neurotransmitter which are secreted by the hippocampal neurons. The glutamatergic, the glutamate or the excitatory neurotransmitter, GABAergic, GABA which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and I told you there is a small population of cholinergic neurons which are present there, but which is marred with controversies for a different reason we will not get into that. But there is a small population indeed as the emerging studies are indicating towards it and from my own research account I can tell you with certainty that they are present there. So, now what happens in epilepsy in this circuit? So, I have we have briefly dealt about this circuit right, I know how they are connected CA1, CA3 regions. So, during epilepsy in this structure if you, so let me just put it, so this is week 6 and this is lecture 3 W6 L3. Okay. So, what happens is that at certain small loci or locus wherever I mean this is very difficult to pinpoint small locus there is an hyper excitability. And I have given you the example in the first class, if you remember in this week's first class I told you when we talked about the hyper excitability, just think of it, what does that mean? That means due to hyper excitability, the neurons which are present there, they secrete neurotransmitters more than they are required right if you remember. So, if you just go back to the class where I was trying to show you this aspect something like this hyper excitable and because of hyper excitability say for example, there is a network now let us put neuronal shape into them and this is if how this is how the signal is rolling. Okay. Now, say for example, let us pick up one of them, let us say this one, this particular neuron which I am putting boxing up becomes hyper excitable. Now, the hyper excitability of this neuron, what it will do? it will kind of make this one hyper excitable if it has processes to this one it will make it hyper excitable or process to this one it will make hyper excitable. So, if it is only supposed to send signal like this because of its hyper action it will send anomalous signals to these locations. And if such sites are more, so what will happen? There will be huge amount of anomalous signal which will be coming up, which was not supposed to be there. Now, coming back to the one second, coming back to the circuit, one fine. So, these are those hyper excitable regions what we are talking about. These are different locations, and you just have to break down the image according to the neuronal connectivity and everything right. So, say for example, this is the region which becomes hyper excitable. 
So, such patients have in terms of the molecule, one of the possibilities is that of the pathology is that they may have a defect in neurotransmitter release or neurotransmitter physiology. How that happens, why that happens is something which is an area of constant research, but it looks like some of the neurons possibly either genetically predisposed or there are certain modifications which happens over a period of time, what makes them very hyper excitable, but such patients suffers from what we know as epilepsy. So, this is where most of the epileptic bouts happen in this region. There are other places, but this is the major one. And this hyper excitability physiologically further lead to excitatory brain damage. Excitatory damages. So, because in that location there are hyper excitable situation, such hyper excitable situation leads to change the excitable properties of the neurons around it and they at times because of higher metabolic activity, higher metabolic activity are gets damaged. Okay. So, this is what happens in epilepsy. When this is going to happen cannot be predicted. At certain specific time it happens, it does not happen continuously. So, that makes our hypothesis kind of very weak, because you cannot even predict when this is going to happen. If they are intensely thinking or some stress or something, we do not know. We cannot tell anything with certainty. Some of the patients do say they are feeling that they will get about like that, but we really cannot say with certainty. But this is something what happens. And this is known to the clinicians or the neuroanatomist, neurophysiologist, neurologist neurosurgeons for a long period of time. So, back in 1940s in Canada, there was one surgery which was done to a patient. The surgery was done because this patient was suffering from epileptic bouts on a frequent basis pretty frequently. So, he was a coal miner, was suffering from epileptic bouts time and again, time and again, time and again. And every time he has to be admitted to the hospital for <clears throat> proper care. And this was becoming a really a clinging issue for both the employers and for the patient. So, doctors were aware of the location within the brain where this epileptic waves are getting generated. Okay. So, automatically if there is an hyper excitability, so the waves will be generated you know. And they knew it is happening in the hippocampus. So, they did a simple surgery. For that time it was the simplest surgery they can think of. So, they remove. So, this was the anatomy, anatomical aspects what I drew earlier in the earlier classes. So, they remove or the hippocampus and the results were stunning. This individual who was suffering from epileptic bouts got rid of the epilepsy definitely. From the surgical perspective, 
it was a complete success. But then he never ever acquired any further memory. That was the stunner. So, from that point till the last moment of his life or her life, this individual lived without acquiring any memory based on the memories what he has earlier or whatever. That was not something which was expected by the surgeons. Sometimes things happen and you really do not predict, it just happened to happen, it was just like that. So, that one which so where you put it, exploration, medical twist changed the story of neuroscience forever. So, this is 1940s and 48 when this happened. So, before that, earlier to that, we were never sure that where information are being stored. So, some of the questions which completely were beyond our reach even to address were few questions. The first one is what is memory? The question one, it was beyond our anything to you know, approach this question. We, so, most of the research you might wonder what was happening is that mostly on behavior. The whole field was purely on psychological parameters which were very well established and thanks to all those psychologists who really established the field in such a wonderful way that you know today they come so handy. So, now we have traveled almost in you know, 60, 70 years since that time. Psychology and behavior, these were the only way you can approach the brain, but then there was nothing after that. There was no cellular basis to understand anything. So, what is memory? This was one of the question which was not really there relevant to that was cellular basis of memory. If you do not know where the memory is happening, you cannot even address that question. What is memory formation or the process of memory formation? process of memory formation. Well, to answer or address, answer is a wrong word, to address the first question what I put there, what is memory? Well, if I ask you what you understand by memory, your immediate response will be, we have memory cards, we have hard drives, we have computer memories, where basically on some platform or on some surface or something, there are some kind of inscription where the informations are getting stored either in some kind of a bytes using you know 0, 1 or binary logics. This is what mankind as a whole best understanding of memory to this state. So, there are 0, 1, 0, 1 binary coding 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Likewise, there are physical. So, say for example, if there is a plate like this, on a plate like this, there are physical signature of any event which is put in some mechanical way into that 0, 1 coding different ways and all, and that is what we understand by memory. So, it means our understanding of memory is physical, something which is physical. 
Now, the question arises in a biological system, where is that physical parameter? What is that physical basis of memory? Cellular basis, so let me add one more here. physical basis of memory. What is the physical basis? Right? Because whenever we talk about biology, we talk about there are proteins, there are DNA, there are carbohydrates, there are vitamins, there are minerals, there is water and there are cells. Now, when we talk about a physical basis like this, if I draw this and if I say draw a, a neuron and if I say a neuron store information, my first question which will be coming is where is that physical aspect of it? Say for example, is there some kind of a change happening, something, something which will be stored and if it has a change has to happen, the change can only happen in either in a lipid which is forming the bilipid layer of the membrane or it can happen in a protein or it can happen to a carbohydrate. or it could happen to a you know some other x y z or to even water right and not only that whatever changes which are happening there that has to persist 70 to 80 years so it means that molecule which see this change has to retain that change for next 70 to 80 years now going by your cell biology logics and the word what we have used time and again in biology turnover of molecules. Turnover of molecules means you have a protein which is becomes older than you get it is replaced by the newer proteins. Similarly, you have carbohydrate molecule they are replaced similarly you have lipids molecule which are getting replaced time and again and their dynamic structure they are moving around slowly gradually within even in the membrane the lipid molecules shift their position lateral shift diffusion uh, flip flop and series of such things. If you go through Albert's book on cell biology you will see this. Now, the question arises if there is a permanent change where the change is happening what is that change or do we want to believe or do we want to accept that every memory storage what is happening has something to do with the DNA. It means there is a permanent change happening in the DNA that does happen though I am not ruling that out, but for everything that is something we do not know. As a matter of fact, nobody knows, it is not that we do not know, like you ask anybody they can give you several mathematical zygmos and uh, biological zygmos, but to tell with absolute clarity that yes, this is the change, this is what is happening, this is how it is happening and likewise and so on and so forth, I guarantee you that no one can tell this with absolute certainty, because we do not know. We can only tell when we know, we do not know. As of now, we do not know. But because of this one discovery, that if you remove a part of the brain which is termed as hippocampus, further memory formation does not occur, opens up a Pandora's box to approach memory from a different angle, right? So, it means the second question which is there, this question process of memory formation. So, now we have some point in the brain to put our probe or electrode to figure out ok, now I have this point in the brain from where I can start the story. So, that is why I told you this 
particular accident or whatever you call that exploration opens up a whole new dimension about neuroscience. It took us to a different world altogether and we are indebted to those people whatever they did to save that patient from epilepsy really gave mankind an access to understand how the memory formation has happening. We are not saying what is memory, how possibly this is happening. But then having said this, we have to go a little bit backward to the psychologist what kind of theories they have proposed earlier to that. So, I told you that the field has been ruled by the psychologist, eminent psychologist, behaviorologist or ethologist for a long time before these kind of discoveries which allowed the anatomist, cell biologist really to understand or try to explore these events at the molecular level. Earlier to that, it was all this treating brain as a black box and doing some kind of a white noise analysis. So, what were the theories of learning and memory proposed by eminent psychologists earlier to that? The gentleman who proposed the very first learning model was Donald Hebb. Let me put it here once again. Okay. His name was Donald Hebb and what we commonly known as Hebbian learning model. So, what I will do in the next class is, we will start exploring what was Hebbian learning model and what were the subsequent studies which took place in the field of hippocampal neural transmission, which bring us at this point, where we have a some fair degree of understanding how memory formation is occurring possibly in the brain. Okay. Thank you. So, in the next class, we will start with HEPS proposition and the follow up experiments.